I was ready for work, seated at the breakfast table with my coffee and the morning paper, while Janet was still getting dressed in the bedroom. This morning seemed just like any other workday of the past year. As I skimmed the front page, there it was, right in the middle, as Carmine had predicted last night. Carmine always follows through on his promises. The news article reported a man found executed in his garage. Robert Tolson, an employee of Calcus Realty Agency, was found dead, having been thumped and then strangled. Janet also works at Calcus Realty. Currently, the police have no suspects, and the investigation is just beginning. There was no need to read further. I folded the paper and placed it on the table where Janet always sits. A warm, comforting feeling washed over me as I contemplated the events leading up to this morning. Sipping my coffee, I watched as Janet entered the breakfast area. My, was she beautiful. My wife of five years looked even more stunning today than she did seven years ago when we first met. There were no exchange greetings as she poured herself a cup of coffee. It's hard to believe how much our marriage had declined in the past year. Our eyes met briefly, and I smiled slightly as I acknowledged her arrival. She said nothing to me, continuing a pattern that had persisted for the past two months after our major argument about her increased working hours. She seemed to withdraw into herself, displaying a coldness that contrasted sharply with her warmth during our courtship. I missed that closeness dearly. Now it seemed like it was all coming to an end. Janet picked up the paper in one hand and her coffee cup in the other. Her eyes scanned the headlines and suddenly she spat out her coffee, her eyes fixed on the article about Robert Tolson's homicide. Oh God, no, she cried out, looking as if she were about to vomit as she rushed to the bathroom. I sat there in silence, knowing there was nothing I needed to say to her about the subject. Taking a deep breath, I stood up, placed my coffee cup in the dishwasher, and grabbed my briefcase. I went out to the garage and got into my car, not bothering to check on Janet's well-being. It didn't matter to me anymore how she was feeling. Now, let me introduce myself. My name is John Canella, but my friends call me JC. I'm 29 years old, of Sicilian descent in the Italian section of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My youth was mostly spent getting into trouble with a gang of other young Italian boys. We fancied ourselves as the junior mafia. I'll skip over most of the other misadventures we got into and focus on the one event that significantly changed my direction. Carmine Vitalio and I were closer than two natural brothers. We were the same age and hung out with the same group of guys. The main difference between Carmine and me was brain power. I won't claim Carmine was unintelligent or anything of the sort, it's just that he seemed incapable of avoiding trouble with the law. Despite our shared misdeeds, he was the one who typically got caught by the police. One evening, Carmine and I broke into a warehouse near the dock, hoping to steal some items for quick cash. The security guards must have spotted us entering through a side window because they were waiting as we tried to leave with several boxes of MP3 players. One guard nabbed Carmine just as I turned, while another tried to grab me. I pushed a box into his face and then leaped onto the other guard's back, striking him on the side of his head with all my strength. As he released Carmine, I pulled him to the ground, urging him to flee as fast as he could. Carmine ran off, leaving me behind. The second guard recovered and grabbed me from behind, and there wasn't much of a struggle after that. The guards roughed me up until the cops arrived. When they showed up, they laughed with the guards as they examined my bruised and bloodied body. I was taken to the police station and held in a cell until my parents came to get me released. Long story short, I never revealed the identity of my accomplice in the warehouse. I received two weeks in jail and probation. Carmine called me multiple times to apologize for leaving me behind, but I reassured him it was fine, considering his prior record could have landed him in jail for much longer. He vowed to make it up to me, no matter how long it took. My parents were furious and embarrassed by my arrest. My dad disciplined me with his leather belt until I was almost bleeding and then they decided to enroll me in St. Peter's Catholic High School to straighten me out. Needless to say, the nuns and the priest did an excellent job of disciplining me. By my senior year, I had changed my lifestyle. One of the priests who mentored me encouraged me to pursue a different path, so I left the neighborhood gang and eventually performed well enough to be accepted to Penn State again. In short, I succeeded in college and graduated with a degree in human resources, Finding a job with a reputable company after graduation was easy. For once, my parents were proud of me. Though I dated numerous women in college, 
I wasn't ready for a serious commitment. It wasn't until three years after graduating that I met Janet Ficanio, who made me reconsider my bachelorhood. We met at a seminar for HR representatives. Afterward, I got her phone number and promised to call her, which seemed to please her. Janet was unlike any other woman I had dated, with a multifaceted personality. At times, she reminded me of Chris Costner's character in The Three Faces of Eve. The trait I least admired about Janet was her stubbornness. Once she formed an opinion on an issue, nothing could dissuade her from her belief, no matter how misguided it might be. Our dating experience was characterized by periods of closeness, followed by distance. We refrained from engaging in carnal activity. Within the first year of our relationship, I learned of Janet's abandonment as an infant. Her mother left her in a church pew and departed from her life, leading to her upbringing in orphanages and foster homes. I firmly believe that the absence of maternal love and care during her formative years contributed significantly to Janet's personality struggles. Despite her challenges, Janet remained the most affectionate and warm-hearted person I had ever known. During our early years together, my parents did not support my relationship with Janet. Throughout our courtship, they cautioned me about becoming too involved with her, but I disregarded their advice. Janet and I exchanged vows in a modest ceremony at our local church. We both agreed to postpone starting a family until we were financially stable, and Janet could transition to being a full-time mother, a decision that my parents disapproved of. Trouble emerged in our marriage during the third year when Janet's company was acquired by a larger corporation, resulting in the loss of her job. She struggled with depression due to losing a job she valued. Although we weren't facing financial hardship, it took several months for Janet to secure a new job, which she wasn't enthusiastic about, an office manager position at the Calcus Realty Agency. I made an effort to support Janet during her period of unemployment, but at times, I felt she resented my fulfilling job while she settled for less. She experienced significant mood swings, particularly during her monthly cycle. After a few months at Calcus, she gradually regained her usual pleasant demeanor. Our situation improved, including our bed life, which had suffered during her unemployment. There were moments in our bedroom when I sensed Janet was trying hard to compensate for the rough patch by being more assertive in our lovemaking. For about nine months, I didn't complain, and our married life thrived. Janet became more enthusiastic about her job and even pursued a home study course in real estate. I was pleased with her transformation and the loving wife she was to me. Then, amidst challenging circumstances, came both good and bad news. The good news was my steady advancement up the management ladder at my company. After five years with them, my future looked promising. However, a merger with an Atlanta-based company led to significant changes in my job responsibilities. The Atlanta company was to be integrated into our corporate structure, giving me the responsibility to train their personnel and make necessary staff reductions. I was excited about the new challenges, but the downside was that I would be traveling more frequently and for longer periods away from home. Janet was not pleased with the prospect of my increased time on the road, even though I made efforts to be home for weekends during longer trips. Initially, Janet's anger about my frequent absences seemed to be appeased, but, as is often the case, complications arose. Gradually, my return home on weekends proved insufficient to compensate for my extended time away. Janet entrenched herself in a stubborn mindset, accusing me of enjoying my absence and even insinuating that I might have a lover in Atlanta. Despite my efforts, including calling her during the day and sending flowers and humorous cards, her aloofness persisted. Completing the staff training in Atlanta took nearly six months, marking the conclusion of my travels. Additionally, I received a promotion at corporate headquarters, expecting these changes to improve Janet's perception of me. However, it appeared I was mistaken. Once I stopped traveling, Janet increased her workload at the agency. When I questioned her about it, she sarcastically remarked that it was her turn to work for a promotion and suggested it was time for me to experience solitude in the evenings. Our closeness suffered. Two weeks ago, Janet informed me that she and her colleagues would be away for the weekend, attending a developer's session for high-rise condominiums near the riverfront. She deemed it essential for her career advancement without consulting me about her absence, leaving no room for discussion. Even though I stopped running with the junior mafia back in high school, I stayed close with some of my best pals, 
especially Carmine. I rang him up and asked if he wanted to catch the Steelers versus Raiders game on Sunday. Without hesitation, he agreed, knowing how to score the best tickets for Steelers games. I mentioned Janet's business trip, so Carmine suggested I spend the weekend with him and the guys, catching up on neighborhood gossip. The idea of a weekend away from home sounded fantastic, so I didn't bother telling Janet my plans. Friday morning was chilly, and over breakfast, I casually inquired about reaching Janet while she was away. She coolly brushed off the idea, saying she'd be with influential people and didn't want interruptions. It felt like she saw me as a nagging parent, rather than a husband. I let it go, and later that day, Janet left for Atlantic City. Meeting up with Carmine was a real reunion. It had been over a year since we last hung out. I was one of the few who managed to leave the old neighborhood without ending up behind bars. Carmine also mentioned a debt he owed me, promising to help me out whenever I needed. Saturday night, we hit up the Sweet Kitty Cat Lounge on the southeast side, a strip joint reminiscent of the Bada Bing Club from The Sopranos. The place was packed with scantily clad dancers, just like in the show. A young woman, who seemed not much older than her 18th birthday, approached and danced provocatively in front of me. Carmine mentioned that she was available for the night, placing emphasis on the idea that she could be mine if I wanted. During this, he engaged in inappropriate physical contact. In response, I expressed my commitment to marital vows, acknowledging my temptation, but affirming that loyalty and fidelity hold significance for me. I declined the advances of the alluring stripper, and she moved on to another interested male customer. Carmine, expressing disbelief, commented that I seemed really serious about the fidelity thing. I affirmed my stance, stating that without fidelity, there would be nothing, no love, no marriage. The next morning brought the typical cold, windy Pittsburgh weather, but that didn't deter the horde of fans trekking to Three River Stadium for the Steelers vs. Raiders game. The bitter rivalry between these two football teams borders on gang warfare since the Steelers snatched victory from the jaws of defeat in one of the NFL's most memorable moments. With a fortunate bounce, Franco Harris found himself on the end of an unlikely reception, changing the outcome of a fantastic defensive struggle with the Oakland Raiders in the first-ever playoff game at Pittsburgh's Three Rivers Stadium. Neither team has forgotten that legacy. It's a good thing weapons are not permitted on the playing field. The Steelers weren't having a great year at this point in the season, with a record of five wins and five losses. Today marked the biggest game of the season, with the silver and black back in town. It was hard headbanging all afternoon on the football field. I was getting hoarse from all the shouting and screaming, but the final score was Steelers 21, Raiders 20. The day couldn't have ended on a better note, or so I thought. Despite Carmine's invitation to celebrate, I had to bow out and tell him another time. Tomorrow would be a hard day at the office, and I knew I didn't need a hangover on top of all the other job pressures. Besides, Janet was coming home this evening, and I wanted to be there when she got home. However, Janet did not come home Sunday night. I left for work Monday morning with serious doubts in my mind about the latest developments in my marriage. There had been a sense of impending doom whenever I thought deeply about the state of the relationship between Janet and myself. Sure, there were rough patches in all marriages, but maybe our marriage had decayed into something more than just a rough patch. The workday was as hectic as expected when I left home in the morning, with several high-level meetings and a persecution lawsuit brought against the company high on my agenda. It wasn't until 5.30 that I had a chance to sit down and check my emails. There were a dozen emails from the staff, along with the latest information on the lawsuit. Near the end of the list of emails, there was one titled, Who Was the Last One to Know? As I opened the email, anticipating a humorous animated cartoon, I was suddenly confronted with a photo of Janet and another man engaged in a passionate embrace and a lip-locked kiss. At the bottom of the photo, there was a text message that simply suggested, Want to know what happened after this? Click on the next link. A cold chill raised up my spine as I hesitated for a moment, staring at the photo of Janet kissing another man. Then I clicked on the next link. The screen flashed up another photo. This time, Janet and the man she was kissing were both unclothed and standing together in a motel room. Again at the bottom of the photo was a text message that simply said, Want to know what happened after this? Click on the next link. My hand was trembling. There was a tightness in my throat and chest, 
as the unclothed image of my wife burned itself into my brain. There was a part of me that did not want to see the next photo. Still, I knew I had to click on the link. The next photo was the end of my marriage, with Janet on the bed on all fours, with the same man as in the other two photos, displaying an expression of lust and ecstasy on her face. The sole woman I ever wholeheartedly loved turned out to be an unfaithful adulteress. I placed my love and trust in her entirely, and now she was tearing my heart from my chest. The text at the photo's bottom read, Prick provided by Robert Toldson. My worst nightmare had been thrust in my face. Undoubtedly, Janet's recent coldness wasn't merely a wife upset with her husband. It resembled rigor mortis setting into our dying marriage. What followed? Anger and rage. For me, it was a calm resolve, a feeling I hadn't experienced in a long time. Revenge settled into my mind, as infidelity and betrayal wouldn't stand in my lifetime. Two people would pay dearly for knowingly heaping insults upon me. My initial thoughts revolved around the person sending incriminating emails. No name or indication of the sender's identity. Questions echoed in my head. Why send this email? What did they hope to gain by exposing my wife's infidelity? Were they friends or enemies of Janet? I'd have to address these questions later. I inserted a CD into my computer, copied the email and three photos, then deleted it. A scrubber program erased all evidence from my hard drive. Sitting back in my swivel chair, making sense of Janet's betrayal, I could only attribute it to her multiple personalities. Yet, if she wanted a divorce, I would have granted it, and we both could have walked away from this marriage wreck. But now, my revenge would be swift and complete. I'd show no mercy to either of them. The plan began to solidify in my mind. Leaving the office, I found a payphone around the corner. Dialing an untraceable pay-as-you-go cell phone, I informed Carmine that I believed it was time for me to collect on the debt he owed me. Upon returning home around 7.30, I found Janet already there, watching TV. She didn't rush to greet me but commented on my late arrival, saying I was coming home late. In response, I noted that she was also coming home late, as I moved to the kitchen. Silence hung between us. I grabbed a beer and headed to my office, ensuring to lock the door. In our country, a person convicted of a capital crime usually gets one of two sentences, the pass-away penalty or life in prison. My revenge plan involved one pass-away penalty and one life sentence. I needed some quiet time to finalize my revenge plan. Carmine would handle Mr. Robert Tolson and I'd personally settle the score with Janet. To make the revenge appear as a simple case of a wife leaving her husband, I sent flowers to Janet's office and made dinner reservations near her workplace. I left messages for her to meet me, but she never showed up. I instructed the maitre d' to give our table to someone else, ensuring he'd remember my wife standing me up. Janet returned home that evening without offering any explanation or reason for missing our dinner reservation. The fact of the matter was, I had no interest in anything she might have said in defiance. The die had been cast and the wheels of revenge were set in motion. The following day, a courier came to my office and handed me an envelope marked personal and confidential. Inside, there was a single sheet of paper with a bold heading instructing to destroy it after reading. The first sentence on the paper advised me to secure an airtight alibi for the upcoming night. The second sentence provided a name, Carlos Mandara, and a phone number. I read and reread the phone number until I had it memorized. The paper was then sent through the shredder, and I collected the shredded pieces to be discreetly dropped into various trash cans outside the office building that evening. I arrived home before Janet, changed clothes, poured a tall gym beam, and sat down to listen to some smooth jazz. The TV remained off. It was to be my night as king of my castle. Janet had to find her own entertainment. There was no confrontation when she got home, she quickly assessed the scene and turned around, walking out the door again. I couldn't care less about her destination, whether out to eat or to meet Robert Toldson. The sand in the hourglass was almost empty for both of them. I was in bed when Janet finally returned, slipping quietly alongside me. Silence was the loudest noise before I fell asleep. Thursday evenings were the usual poker night for some guys from work, held in the back room of the old stagecoach bar. This served as my airtight alibi for the rest of the evening. This time, I was the one slipping into bed early in the morning. The clock on my nightstand read 2.35 as I pulled the covers over me. 
not a sound or movement from Janet. Falling asleep wasn't difficult, even though I knew what had taken place earlier that evening. Now that Robert Toldson had faced his pass-away penalty, it was time to mete out punishment to the second perpetrator. Immediate action wasn't required for the life imprisonment penalty. Janet's punishment would commence after a phone call, providing a sense of satisfaction and justice. Whatever it was in Janet's warped personality that led her to blatantly disrespect me was for someone else to determine. I no longer felt any compassion toward the woman I once loved with all my heart and soul. The impending retribution was of her own making. The police interviewed every member of the Calcus Realty Agency staff, gathering interesting but inconsistent statements. Janet faced multiple police interviews. Detective Lawrence Bact questioned me about Robert Toldson, attempting to bait questions about a more than professional relationship between Robert and Janet. I affirmed my complete faith in my wife's fidelity, dismissing any doubt. He just smiled at me, perhaps pitying me as a poor betrayed man. The funeral service for Robert Toldson took place on Tuesday. That morning, I observed Janet wearing her somber black dress, the same one she had worn to my mother's funeral. She didn't inquire if I wanted to accompany her to Robert's funeral. Whatever thoughts she had regarding Robert's pass away, she kept to herself. Undoubtedly, she had much to ponder, including the homicide and her infidelity. Over the following week, Janet appeared eager to engage in a serious discussion about our relationship. However, my cold shoulder promptly halted her attempts. I had moved beyond any possibility of reconciliation or making amends. I held the power to end the charade whenever I chose. Three weeks after Robert's homicide, police investigations seemed to lose momentum. No new leads emerged, and there were suggestions that Robert might have been executed by a loan shark or a bookie. During this period, Janet's mental state continued to decline, marked by increased absent-mindedness and confusion. Little things frightened her, yet I offered no assistance or solace, even witnessing her struggle. I thought to myself, too bad, as I observed her slowly unravel. Finally, on the subsequent Thursday, I placed the call to Carlos. The plan was already set, and he was eager to set it in motion. Janet had only hours left before her new life would begin. Friday morning, I left for work before Janet was dressed, deliberately avoiding a final encounter in my house. The sand in the hourglass had run out. Across the street from our house, a car with two men lay in wait. The kidnapping unfolded at a four-way stop sign intersection, with vehicles in front and behind Janet's car preventing any escape. With the precision of a Delta Force team, two men acted swiftly. As the driver's door opened, a needle punctured her arm while the seatbelt was cut away. Janet was pushed into the passenger seat, and one of the men took the driver's seat. The three vehicles departed rapidly, the entire process lasting less than 30 seconds. No witnesses were present. At 11 o'clock that morning, in a branch bank on the east side of town, a woman made up to look exactly like Janet entered and handed a withdrawal slip for $25,000 from our joint account to the teller. She presented a driver's license and passport as proof of identity. The teller took a few minutes to issue the withdrawal in the form of a cashier's check. A guard escorted the woman to her car, noting the license plate as she drove away. The line at the American Airlines ticket counter was short. The Janet lookalike approached the counter, presented her photo ID and passport, and received the boarding pass. Flight reservations had been made online the previous night. The first leg of the journey was to JFK Airport, followed by a non-stop flight on number 951, to Rio de Janeiro. The Pittsburgh departure was at 4.45 in the afternoon, reaching JFK, New York. Subsequently, at 10.30 that evening, the American Airlines plane took off, carrying the passenger, Janet Canella, on an overnight flight to Brazil. I waited until noon on Saturday before contacting the police to report a missing person. Surprisingly, Detective Lawrence Bacton was the officer who arrived at the house to take the report. I informed him that Janet had not returned home at her usual time. Attempts to reach her on her cell phone were futile, as it displayed a non-in-service notification. When I contacted Amanda Staccata, one of Janet's close friends at Calcus Realty, she revealed that Janet had not shown up for work the previous day and hadn't even called in to report her absence. Detective Bacton made cryptic notes in his notepad while occasionally glancing up at me. Eventually, he began questioning the state of my marriage probing into potential problems that might be related to Janet's disappearance. 
I reiterated what I had told him after Robert Toldson's homicide investigation. Our marriage was fine, and I couldn't fathom any reason for Janet to voluntarily vanish. He then inquired if I had any involvement in foul play concerning Janet, to which I emphatically stated my love for my wife and my inability to damage her. Lying to the police was a skill I developed early in life, associating with the junior mafia, and it continued to serve me well. Three days later, Detective Bacton visited my office during business hours, presumably to assess the husband he was dealing with. Once in my office, he sat down and offered a tight-lipped smile. I wore a distressed husband's expression as I questioned him about any news regarding Janet's whereabouts. He responded, stating that they had retraced Janet's activities after she left my house on Friday morning, providing some information with a mix of positive and negative aspects. Several witnesses claimed to have seen her having coffee at Denny's restaurant on Bennett Street around 10 o'clock on Friday morning. Detective Bacton informed me that Janet had appeared at the Allegheny National Bank around 11 o'clock, as captured on video surveillance. She made a $25,000 withdrawal from our joint savings account. As he shared this information, I expressed disbelief and questioned how it was possible, stating that Janet hadn't mentioned anything about wanting to withdraw money. Detective Bacton assured me that the facts were clear, explaining that the cashier had made photocopies of Janet's driver's license and passport before issuing the cashier's check. He was confident that when I saw the surveillance tape, I would identify the person at the cashier's window as my wife, Janet. Once again, Detective Bacton paused to gauge my reaction to his revelation. I expressed to the detective that I believed there must be some mistake, emphasizing that Janet and I discussed everything happening in our marriage. I maintained a bewildered look while staring back at the police detective, aware that he was saving the most devastating news for last, and I had to prepare for another acting performance. The detective went on to share the most disturbing news, stating that my wife had purchased airline tickets to New York and then to Rio de Janeiro. He mentioned that they located her car in the long-term parking lot at the airport, revealing that her flight left Pittsburgh on Friday afternoon at 4.45, and her flight to Rio left New York at 10.30. The detective informed me that they contacted the Rio de Janeiro police to locate Janet, but she seemed to have vanished once she arrived in Rio. Detective Bacton now stared intently at me, awaiting my response. I exclaimed that it was madness and stated that Janet would never do something like that. I emphasized my belief in her love for me and mine for her, expressing that leaving the country was absurd. In an attempt to portray the betrayed husband, I began to cry right in front of the detective. There was a moment of silence in my office before the detective resumed talking. He asked if I believed this had any connection to the homicide of Robert Toldson. In response, I questioned how he could even ask that, asserting that my wife had no involvement in the homicide. I reminded him that she was interviewed and never charged in connection with that case. The detective clarified that they never charged my wife, but she was high on their suspect list. I responded to the detective's statement about others suggesting my wife and Mr. Toldson were romantically involved. Expressing disbelief, I asserted that it was absurd to accuse her of being linked to the Toldson homicide, emphasizing that more than office gossip was needed to support such a claim. My eyes bore into his as I challenged the credibility of the accusations. The detective explained that they were still investigating, and now that my wife was out of the country, suspicions about her role in the homicide had grown. He paused for a moment and shared that evidence at the crime scene indicated a carnal motive, with Tolson being tortured and thumped for hours before being strangled. In response, I emitted a small laugh, dismissing the idea that my petite wife could have committed such a crime. I questioned the detective's belief in her capability stating that she could barely open a pickle jar, let alone strangle someone. I expressed frustration with the escalating and seemingly baseless accusations. I addressed Detective Bacton, acknowledging that all the evidence thus far pointed to my wife's involvement, and he suggested she may have had assistance. Surprised, I questioned the possibility of being that other person before he could say more. He explained that they considered the possibility but assured me that I had a solid alibi for the time of the homicide. However, his voice lacked conviction. I summarized the situation, expressing my disbelief that they believed my wife had left the country 
due to her involvement in a homicide and that I was a likely suspect in assisting her. Pausing to glare directly at him, I sought clarification, asking if I accurately summarized his statements. He sat there, assessing whether my indignation was genuine or not. Conveying a hint of scorn in my voice, I informed the detective that if there was nothing else, the meeting was over. Rising from my desk, I approached the closed door and opened it, signaling his departure. Dr. Bacton got up from his chair and moved slowly to the door. Thank you for your time, Mr. Canella. I'll keep you informed about your wife's disappearance. He didn't extend his hand, and I didn't offer mine. After the detective left, I closed the door and settled back in my swivel chair. I was sure Dr. Bacton's visit aimed to extract more information than provide substantial details about the two cases. I carefully pondered each statement and question, realizing he suspected my involvement. Yet my alibis were solid. I was playing poker the night Robert Tolson was executed, and I was in meetings all day the Friday when Janet went missing. It was Saturday morning, two weeks after Janet's disappearance. I hadn't heard from Carlos or Carmine. Janet's whereabouts and well-being remained unknown. At times I sensed being followed, morning commutes and evening returns. My actions were meticulously planned, from work to home, with grocery shopping on the way. Nothing suggested evasion or someone trying to conceal. Every other day, I called Detent Bacton for updates on my missing wife, but he had no new information. The Brazilian police found no evidence of Janet after her arrival in Rio. Later that afternoon, I ordered a pizza from Domino's. While watching college football on TV, the doorbell rang, and the pizza delivery guy arrived with my hot pizza. I paid him and offered a couple of bucks as a tip. Upon opening the pizza box in the kitchen, I noticed an envelope on top. Opening it, I pulled out a sheet of paper with instructions for the next day. It directed me to dress for church and attend the 10 o'clock mass at St. Peter S. The note further instructed me to slip out the side door on the east side of the church during communion, where a dark Ford Crown Victoria would be waiting outside. Holding the sheet, I understood that this would be a final meeting with Janet before Carlos shipped her out of the country. He had waited two weeks to ensure the well-documented COVID plan of Janet flying out of the country was all the evidence the police had to work on. Carlos set up an elaborate deception to mislead the investigation, establishing that Janet was alive when she boarded the plane to Rio. This prevented the police from making a circumstantial case against me, even though there was no body to be found. The bedroom was pitch black as I stared at the ceiling. This past month and a half had been a living nightmare for me after receiving that email. The chain of events reminded me that my ancestral roots would always bring out a dark side of my personality. Whenever I was disrespected by anyone, nature or nurture, there was no doubt in my mind where my dark side came from. St. Peter's is a large church, and the 10 o'clock mass is highly attended by several hundred parishioners. It was easy to get lost in that crowd and spot if anyone was following me. If the police trailed me, they must have waited outside the church as the throng of people moved to the front of the church for communion. I quickly slipped out the side door. The dark Ford sedan was waiting with the motor running, and I got into the back seat as the car roared into the busy street. The trip took about 10 minutes, before the big sedan pulled up in front of a large warehouse building. The driver never turned around, instructing me to enter the building through the side door. Inside the large empty building, there was an office area near the back, with light coming from several windows. As I approached, Carlos stepped out and walked toward me, marking our first face-to-face -face meeting. Carlos greeted me, mentioning that Carmine said it was all right to call me JC. We shook hands, and Carlos, with a stoic expression, warned me about Janet's changed condition, hinting that seeing her might be distressing. I expressed that I was past caring about her appearance or what she had gone through since they took her, and I walked toward the open door. Stopping at the door, I inquired if she was on medications now. Carlos replied that she wasn't, but admitted she probably wished she were. He claimed to have kept her clean and very conscious all the time, asserting that she was now a broken woman and well-trained for her new life. We both entered a well-lit room where Janet was tied to a chair in the center. I circled her, standing directly in front. Despite being inches apart, she remained silent, her gaze beyond my shoulder, lacking the sparkle and vitality in her eyes. I addressed Janet, expressing that for the rest of her life, 
she would remember bringing misery upon herself. I recounted enduring her mood swings and cold attitude, emphasizing that her infidelity and the disrespect she and her lover showed were intolerable. I asserted that she would spend the rest of her life paying for her infidelity, mentioning that Robert had already paid his debt to me. Speaking slowly, I wanted her to understand that it was me who brought her and her lover to justice. Despite having once loved her, I conveyed my current loathing towards her. I informed her that Carlos assured me she would be well taken care of where she was being sent, as good care as they provide for their best horses and cattle. I stood for a moment longer, observing a tear forming in Janet's eye. It was the only acknowledgement I received before turning and walking out. The Ford sedan returned me to St. Peter S., where I went inside. As the eleven o'clock mass ended, I left the church and drove straight home. A hard knot inside my gut needed drowning with some Jim Beam. It's been three years since I last saw Janet. I've almost forgotten her completely, with no traces in my life. I sold the house we lived in at her disappearance. Docton Bacton's cases are now in the cold case file. I spend more time with Carmine at the Sweet Kitty Cat Lounge. I've sampled all the offerings of that sweet young stripper on more than one occasion. Marriage is out of the question. My five years with Janet convinced me that women are more trouble than they are worth once you marry them. My parents were right about regretting my involvement with Janet. Children should listen to their parents' advice, though they rarely do. I later found out Amanda Stoccata sent me the email. She was Robert Tolson's lover before he dumped her for Janet. I never thanked her for the email. Nor did I discover how she obtained those photos of Robert and Janet. I guess she got her revenge the same time I did. There's something written about the wrath of a woman scorned.